Uh, and today it is my uh, distinct pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Mila Firstig. She is a professor of law and uh, director of uh, human rights program at the University of Virginia Law School. Um, she's a foremost expert on comparative constitutional law um, as she studies the uh, origins, uh, evolution, and the efficacy of uh, provisions of uh, especially rights provisions in national constitutions across the globe. Um, and her publications have appeared in uh, various uh, uh, top journals, such as uh, California Law Review, New York University Law Review, University of Chicago Law Review, American Journal of International Law, um, the Journal of Legal Studies, all these law school journals, as well as top political science journals, such as the American Journal of Political Science and American Political Science Review. Um, she has uh, two law degrees, one from Tilburg University in the Netherlands and the other from Harvard Law School. And she also has a PhD in uh, sociolegal studies from Oxford University. Um, in addition to all these uh, scholarly publications and achievements, her work and her uh, commentaries have been featured in various media outlets, uh, probably most uh, well known of which is a front page New York Times uh, piece uh, uh, that featured her co-authored research with David Law uh, that looked at the influence of, uh, declining influence of American constitution uh, throughout the world relative to the rise of uh, Canadian constitution. Uh, that was featured in New York Times. Uh, she also appeared in the New Yorker, Wall Street Journal, Huffington Post, uh, Washington Post, and all those uh, um, important and influential media outlets. And she's here today to talk about her uh, some parts of her book manuscript. Um, and the talk, talk is entitled, Just Words, The Effectiveness of Constitutional Rights. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Thirsty. Thanks so much, Kia, for the very generous introduction. And thank you, everybody, for coming out in the not so nice weather uh, today. So, and it's great to be here. So I was told to talk for 45 minutes, which is a little long, but I'll try to be uh, as long as I possibly can. Uh, so, so I want to talk today about the question whether constitutional rights actually make a difference, meaning do they actually constrain governments and do they actually change government behavior in some way that we can measure. Uh, so there, as some of you may know, there is a fairly extensive literature on this question uh, for human rights treaties, right? So I think there's now maybe like 60 or so papers that have dealt with the question, do, do human rights treaties actually change government behavior in some way? But uh, for constitutional rights, I think there's about five or six papers that have looked at this uh, over time, uh, some of which are early papers that had more limited data. So this is really like sort of a big research agenda that I'm presenting that, that tries to get at this question. Uh, so it's, a, I mean, it's a project, I should say up front, that's at the one hand, it's somewhat far along, as in like my co-author Adam Chilton and I, we've been at this question for a while. So we have one paper uh, that looks at uh, the, the uh, uh, political rights and how they uh, constrain government behavior that appeared in the American Journal of Political Science. And then we have a paper on torture prohibitions and we have a separate paper on social and economic rights. Uh, but at the same time, these are all these super short papers where we don't get to say very much and they mainly tell, they go through uh, in great length at all the different, like the, the sort of statistics behind the, the work we did. Uh, so. So we decided to, to turn the project or the various papers into a book manuscript. And the book manuscript is at a very early stage, right? So in the book manuscript, we're hoping to flesh out the theoretical mechanisms more. We're hoping to um, do some case studies, travel to countries, talk to judges, and so on. So the book, uh, but we're at a very early stage for that. And I, I, I would love to take advantage of the, the sort of expertise in this crowd as we're sort of, you'll see over the course of my presentation, some things we think we know, but others we're still sort of wrestling with or finding out because it's not an easy question. Like, do constitutional rights actually matter? Or more importantly, under what circumstances do we find that they matter? Uh, so yeah, so the, the goal is to present sort of various pieces of, my, uh, of our findings of these various papers. Um, so our starting point in all of this is that it is not obvious 
that constitutional rights actually constrain government behavior and that they actually make a difference. Uh, and, and when I say that, there's, that's both based on sort of empirical observation and, and sort of looking at the data and looking at around the world, as well as on theoretical grounds. And I'll say a little bit about each. Uh, so, so first of all, as constitutions are being uh, rewritten, a lot of emphasis is put on bills of rights. So the international community tends to be heavily involved as constitutions are being rewritten. One important piece of information, by the way, because are most people here American? So uh, whatever you know about the US Constitution, kind of forget about it when you start thinking about foreign constitutions, because they are pretty different. right? So first of all, most countries rewrite their constitutions very often. There is interesting research. I guess I have to mention this because I teach at UVA and this goes to the point of Thomas Jefferson. So, so Thomas Jefferson famously said uh, each generation should write its own constitution and he calculated. He's like, how long is a generation? He had like these tables and he calculated a generation last 19 years. So his proposal was every 19 years the, the United States needs a new constitution. Uh, and then it turns out, so there's this research by Tom Ginsburg, Stack Alkins, and James Melton who've written a book on this. They actually looked at how long the average constitution lasts around the world. Guess what? It's 19 years. Isn't it striking? <laughs> so most countries, their constitutions last about a generation, and then they frequently amend them too. So they're, like I think I've looked at is every five years on average is when a constitution gets amended. And these documents are long, they're detailed, they have a lot of rights provisions in them, and they tinker with their rights provisions, and they add new rights provisions, right? So there is, uh, so there is this is a very different universe in constitution making, as in constitutions get rewritten fairly uh, often. Uh, so as countries are rewriting their constitutions, there usually there are these moments and all the NGOs come to South Sudan when South Sudan is writing a new constitution and the international consultants come and the American law professors fly in and everybody is going to try to sort of push for more and new rights in these documents. So one thing, so if you just simply look at the number of rights, and this is based on 86 different rights, uh, you see that th their number has increased quite a bit from like something like 21 rights in, in 94, uh, right after after World War II to 42 today, and that's on average. On the far end, you have Ecuador, uh, which has pretty much everything that you can think of that is desirable. They t managed to turn into a constitutional right, uh, including the right to clean city air, the right to nutritious locally produced food, I'm quoting from the Ecuadorian constitution here, uh, and the right to lactate in public. Uh, among <laughs> many other rights that you can imagine. Uh, so, and, and, and then on the sort of other end of the scale is the U.S. Constitution, which contains relatively few rights, uh, some unusual rights like the right to bear arms. It turns out not a lot of other countries have that right. Uh, but in any case, so you see sort of the increase in constitutional rights provisions uh, over time. Um, However, our starting point is it's not obvious that these provisions actually will make a difference. And let me, so this is arguably uh, the most famous of example of a constitutional right, right? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof uh, or abridging the freedom of speech or the press, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody knows where this is from? Yes, the United States Constitution, right? Uh, but you can see there are similar protections elsewhere. So here we have citizens are guaranteed freedom of speech, of the press, of assembly, demonstration, and association. Citizens are entitled to submit complaint and petition. Any guesses? Russia? Canada? Yeah, it sounds a bit like the, the First Amendment of the US Constitution. It's actually the <laughs> not so democratic republic of North Korea, right? So they have these beautiful constitutional rights provisions. Now, of course, at this point, you, you may think to yourself, well, it's tri trivially easy to find examples of nice rights provisions of countries that don't uphold these. And of course, that's true, right? So there shall be no discrimination on the basis of sex in Pakistan, which is not really upheld in practice. Nobody may be uh, subjected to physical or psychological torture in Zimbabwe. I actually worked in, on, on Zimbabwean torture cases for a while when I lived in South Africa. This, this is not necessarily respected in practice. Uh, education is a right of all citizens of Afghanistan, which shall be offered up to the BA level in 
uh, in state educational institutions of free of charge. Afghanistan actually has the lowest literacy uh, rate in the world. Uh, so clearly, I mean, of course, it's you know n a little unfair to play the anecdote game. So we can look at uh, uh, some more systematic data. So here, uh, this is from a paper we wrote on uh, constitutional torture prohibitions and their impact. Um, so this is the I'm going to show you data, which I think is the best available data on, on sort of torture and physical integrity protections, which comes from Chris Ferris, who's actually here at the University of Michigan. Uh, so the red lines on this graph, that's a little, uh, can you see that? Yeah. The red lines on this graph uh, show you the average torture rates and confidence interval of countries without constitutional torture prohibition. And higher scores mean less torture. So you see over time, the rate of torture among those countries has, has, uh, has decreased a little bit. Uh, however, the blue lines here show the rates of torture for countries with constitutional torture prohibitions in their constitution. And you see that on average, of course, this doesn't control for anything. They actually torture more. Uh, when they have constitutional protections in their constitution, uh, or when they have a, when they ban torture in their constitution, um, and these differences are actually statistically significant and have uh, sort of increased somewhat over time. Uh, well, of course, it may be wrong to look at all countries uh, 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 all over the world. Uh, so we, you can do, for example, the same for democracy. So here are the democracies uh, that do not have torture prohibitions in their constitution and how much they torture. You'll see uh, that on average, democracies torture less than the global sample. Uh, but again, if I compare that to the democracies uh, with, that actually do ban torture in the constitution, again, you see systematically actually more torture, which is kind of a puzzle, right? Uh, and then we did the same for countries with judicial independence. Again, slight uh, and yet better record overall among countries without the, the ban in their constitution. But then again, we see the ones with torture, actually, with, sorry, with a torture prohibition, actually torture more, which is a, a puzzle. We, we system more systematically analyzed this data in a separate paper where we, of course, you know, add a lot of control variables and, 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 and move to a causal inference framework. And we basically conclude there is no effect, not necessarily a negative effect. Uh, although there's some er interesting early work by Hathaway as well that has concluded that there may be a negative effect of human rights treaties, although that didn't really hold up in, t in later papers either. Uh, but it's, I mean, I guess at this point, um, what it shows is that uh, first, simply putting a right in the Constitution may not be enough to, op to, to get it to work in practice. Second, even democracies do not necessarily live up to their constitutional rights prohibitions. And third, courts cannot always guarantee that, that rights are protected in practice, right? That's at least the, the impression you get from the raw data. Uh, so that then raises the question, do constitutional rights ever make a difference, or when do we find that they make a difference? And that's exactly uh, where our book project uh, starts off. Uh, so, so I just talked to you a little bit about this sort of empirical reason why we may see, why we may be somewhat skeptic on the skeptical about the effect of constitutional rights. Uh, let me say about that a little bit of, in, in theory or the theoretical reasons, because I feel like this is not always um, appreciated as much. So I think it's important to know that one of the fundamental features of constitutional law is that it is law that is directed at the state. Right? It's law for states, if you want, meaning it tells the government to do certain things and not to do certain things. But what if the government decide to ignore this? Right? Then, I mean, if this is a law school, I teach at a law school, people will say, well, uh, there is the courts, and the courts are going to enforce the Constitution, which to some extent is right. right? The courts will interpret the Constitution. But who Who's going to enforce the court decisions, right? And then there may be in the U.S., the U.S. Marshals are going to enforce decisions. But who are they responsible to, right? To the president. So there is a question. There is no, ultimately, no, no ex enforcer that's external to the states because constitutions are, uh, are laws, laws for states, uh, which is different from private law, right? So if me and Keo have a contract 
uh, and I breach the contract, and I, you know you can take me to court, and the state apparatus will enforce uh, our contract ultimately. Whereas when the one of the parties is the, is the state that also has the enforcement apparatus at its disposal, there is always a question: Why do government live up to their constitutional obligations? Uh, so, or as one scholar famously put it, why do the people with the money and the guns ever submit to the people armed only with gavels, meaning the judiciary, right? Or uh, there's this famous anecdote of President Andrew Jackson's response to the Supreme Court in Worcester, Worcester v. Georgia, which, where, where uh, President Jackson said, well, John Marshall made his decision, now let him enforce it, right? And this is, I mean, it gets a little, like, we'll see how this is going to work out in the next few years, right? When you have a president that's not wanting to ignore or wanting to respect the Constitution or Supreme Court decisions. But, uh, but uh, we can't take for granted that constitutional court decisions will be um, enforced. And I always find this interesting because people always immediately accept this point for international human rights treaties, right? We're like, okay, of course, international human rights treaties have no enforcement mechanism. Yes, there are treaty bodies that interpret them, but they're easily ignored. Uh, but there is not, like conceptually, constitutional law and human rights law are not all that different in that they're both law for states. There is a really good article uh, in the Harvard Law Review by uh, Jack Goldsmith and Daryl Levinson that make that point in, in with great force, and I think it's important, right? Because we're easily inclined to think, well, constitutions are different from international human rights law, and we can, of course, point at differences, but in essence, they're both law that is directed at states, and there is always the question, why do states c accept constraints on their potentially unlimited power. Uh, so for, for constitutional law, uh, the starting point or what the literature suggests, and this is the starting point that we adopt, is constitutions need to somehow become self-enforcing, uh, meaning that the cost of complying even with those parts of the constitution that a government or a president may not like uh, outweigh or are, are lower than the cost of governing without constitutional constraints entirely. Right? So at some level, you have something to gain from accepting some constraints on your power, even if you don't like this at this particular point in time. Uh, so, uh, and the literature has proposed various mechanisms of how constitutions can become self-enforcing. So there is some studies that have focused on coordination benefits of the package of having constitutional rules. Uh, so the fact that you have some rules by which you play the political game is valuable for everybody, because otherwise you have chaos, right? You don't know how you're going to elect a president or how many members parliament is going to have or how to run your elections. Uh, and then because you value having rules by which you can play the political game, you also want, you also will uh, conform with the constitutional rights provisions even if you don't necessarily like them because it will uh, sort of, because you value the, the overall package. So that's one sort of mechanism. Uh, we focus on a different mechanism in this, uh, in this paper which is the idea that there are uh, decentralized enforcement actions by interested group of citizens uh, and organizations uh, and the cost that poses upon uh, those in power. Uh, so, so let me uh, develop that idea a little bit more. So the idea here is that constitutional rights can potentially serve as focal points for citizens who want to mobilize against rulers as they give them something to point at when their rights are being violated. So in other words, if there is a right violation or you think your rights are being violated, a government cracks down on, uh, on, on, I don't know, certain groups that are protesting or something like that, you can say, well, this is a violation of the Constitution and wave the Constitution at the government and that may strengthen groups that, that, are, uh, that are protesting or, or want their rights uphold. Uh, so, and of course that mobilization to enforce rights may happen anyway, but having a constitutional right to point to and say, oh, now our rights are violated may empower those groups. That's uh, the idea. None of this is new. Uh, this has its work and uh, its roots in the work by Barry Weingast, who, who made this point forcefully in the, uh, in the 1990s. Uh, uh, and others, um, more recently the a book by Richard McAdams, and more distantly in sort of the work by coordination thinkers, uh, uh, other people. So, uh, so that's sort of the basic idea. However, we add to this, uh, more so than, than Barry Weingast and others, is that a right to point to in and of by itself may not be 
enough to overcome collective action problems if citizens want to enforce their rights. Uh, so a single protester protesting the government likely will end up in jail, right? And a single lawyer may not have the resources to bring a case to court, and a single lobbyist may be unable to stop lobby against proposed legislation. So you, to, to enforce rights against the government and to make violating rights costly, you need to have citizens acting together. Right? And the mere presence of a constitutional right does not necessarily solve the coordination problem. Uh, it may in some circumstances, but it may not, right? because you still have to have groups of citizens acting together trying to enforce their, their constitutional rights protection. Uh, so our core claim in the manuscript is that it's easier to overcome such collective action problems and to mobilize for some rights than it is for others. Uh, so we say some constitutional rights, they have sort of built-in mechanisms, and I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll elaborate a bit more in a second, uh, but we say this, for example, for the right to unionize, which is practiced in an organization, or the right to form political parties, where there is political parties that are already organized as groups, uh, it's easier to overcome collective action problems than for rights that are practiced on an individual basis. I'll spell it out a bit more in a second, but uh, this is I think our main theoretical contribution in the manuscript that we're sort of developing. Uh, so, so Beth Simmons has a fa well-known book manuscript on the impact of human rights treaties, and she basically says all rights matter to the extent there are support structures available, right? And doesn't really make a difference between uh, women's rights or the prohibition of torture necessarily at a conceptual level. Uh, Charles Epps' famous book on rights revolutions is the same thing. He, he had, he, it's a famous study of, of constitutional rights um, causing rights revolutions, and his claim is if there is a support structure for legal mobilization, then rights become a reality, but he doesn't necessarily distinguish between the different types of rights. Uh, Jan Lupu, in a recent series of papers, has focused on sort of the distribution uh, of political power, so opposition in the legislature matters uh, for enforcing human rights agreements or independent courts, but hasn't focused on the different types of rights. And then there is uh, some work by Eric Posner that some of you might know. It's called, uh, has a book that's called The Twilight of Human Rights which is not about zombies, uh, although it's not very optimistic either. But it basically says all rights are lack enforcement mechanism. Uh, none of this really matters, right? And I think we're, we're somewhere in the middle. We say, well, it, different rights have different, uh, different levels of impact. That's sort of the basic uh, idea. So let me spell that out a little bit more. Uh, so, and this is very much a sort of theoretical framework in progress, so I'd love to, to get your, uh, your, your thoughts on this. Uh, but we say that it's especially plausible that uh, collective action problems can be overcome for rights that are practiced within organizations, uh, such as the right to unionize and the right for, to form political parties, and we call those collective rights. Uh, so, and the idea is that because this right, the right to unionize, you can only practice if you actually have unions, right? So, and once there are unions, they can, they have both the incentives and the means to protect their own interest in the face of government transgressions of power. Uh, so, uh, so for example, uh, when a right is violated or, or threatened to be violated, these groups or like unions can do uh, different things. So they could try to take preemptive action ex ante, uh, such as lobbying against a proposed law that would maybe curtail the power of unions, uh, or educating the public about their cause, mobilizing the political opposition if there are certain uh, laws or pro legal proposals that they don't like. Uh, and ex post, they can respond to rights violations. Uh, they can mobilize the political opposition they can stage a protest, they can uh, call a strike, uh, they can bring their claim to court and, and, and try to mobilize lawyers for their cause. Uh, so, so the claim is that once there are organizations or groups of citizens that are already organized, that have a clear interest at stake, they are likely most most able to, to mobilize against transgressions of government power and thus to try to enforce their own rights. Right? So we find, we argue this is the case for, for the right to unionize. Uh, we also say this is true for the right to form political parties, which we find to be an, uh, an effective right. Um, 
So those, that's probably the easiest case where we say, well, rights have sort of this built-in enforcement mechanism. Or you could say some of these rights are sort of self-enforcing because they're practiced in organizations. And these organizations have the means to fight to protect their own interests. Uh, but we also say there are some other cases where we may expect to be something similar. Uh, so some rights, and mainly the freedom of religion, is a right that is individual in nature in the sense that everybody gets to practice their own religion but it's a right that tends to be practiced collectively right so people go to church they go to synagogue or they go to a mosque to to practice their religion so because it is a right that is often practiced in groups or practiced religious uh, collectively it may also be if there were any proposals to crack down on freedom of religion then churches are very they're in a good position to mobilize and try to protect their own interests uh, and then Finally, we say this may be the case, but we're a little less certain about this for, for certain group rights, uh, such as women's rights, because there is a, sort of a big literature, the social mobilization literature has shown if there is a certain identity, group identity that you can appeal to, it's easier for groups to organize to protect their own interests because they have this sort of collective identity that's at stake and that, that mobilizes them. So those, um, So those are the the rights that we say are collective or quasi-collective in nature, where we think maybe they are more effective. And importantly, uh, their impact does not necessarily depend on democracy or the presence of an independent judiciary. Because you can imagine, and we're collecting stories of this right now, churches mobilizing to protect their own interests also in not-so-democratic regimes, right? And, and, their, and the mobilization strategy does not necessarily depend on bringing the case to court because you can also have these other means at your disposal, like lobbying to, to stop proposed legislation or, or call a protest or, or call a strike, right? So we say there's these sort of enforcement mechanisms that are inherent in the nature of some rights and not others that may, uh, may lead to their enforcement. Uh, so at the same time, we say that this is less likely or less, or, or collective action problems are more severe for rights that are purely individual in nature, uh, such as the prohibition of torture, for example, right? So if a government attempts to torture certain groups of, sus I don't know, suspected terrorists or something like that, it is much harder for affected people to mobilize uh, for, for these, to, to and, and to stand up against those, uh, those rights violations. Uh, in fact, in the case of torture, it turns out popular opinion is actually often in favor of, of, of torture under certain circumstances. This survey after survey shows that this is uh, the case. Uh, same, so, and, so the, and the defining characteristic is of the prohibition of torture, it's an individual right, right? It's not something you practice collectively uh, at all. Uh, we say this is the same for the freedom of movement. Uh, for the freedom of expression, although we can talk about this, whether the press ought to be, like whether it ought to be characterized as a right that's exercised collectively. Uh, and we say the same is true for social rights, such as the, uh, the right to health care, the right to education, the right to housing, and the right to social security. Those are the rights that are included in our analysis that we think of as first and foremost individual in character. Uh, although again, we're still like, we're still sort of working on this, uh, on this framework. And of course, our claim is not that nobody ever stands up to protect uh, the prohibition of torture, but again, that it, but, but instead that it may be harder or that these collective action problems are more severe to, to, to protect uh, the, the prohibition of torture, for example. So of course, there may be organizations that do this kind of mobilizing in any given country, but we may not expect them to be there uh, in most countries, or they, I mean, or it's a separate question, right? When does a support structure like the ACLU emerge to protect freedom of expression? But it's not groups uh, that are already organized that are being affected. Um, so that's, that, uh, I guess, in a nutshell, uh, is our core claim on, on, those, on the social rights. So then there is the question, how do we go about uh, testing this. Are there any questions at this point? Because I'm now moving to the empirics and I'm, I'm happy to, you know, like have a conversation. I feel like I always get very conscious of myself when I talk too long. Yeah, Barb. Uh-huh. 
foods that children have, which right will mm -hmm. that kind of the most successful mobilization, but then is there going to be something, and, and if there is, you're going to get to it in your theory about why some days, whether it's like in, Sim in the Simmons work, right, it's these states that are not, you know, one party states where there are differences of opinion, yeah. and so like something in Lucid, or there's opposition to the, those who are mm -hmm. Well, the rights, like how, in the end, it's got to be the courts, right, that enforce. So why aren't we back to the state won't enforce it again? I guess I'd have two answers to that. So one is uh, uh, the that on the one hand, you'd say, well, trade unions, do they really need a state apparatus to enforce, right? <laughs> yes, to bring their cases to courts, uh, but maybe not if they want to stage a nationwide strike or have their workers in a particular industry go on strike. You don't need a democracy to pull off a strike or to have a major protest in some major square, right? So at one level, you don't, but for some strategies, you do, right? So to the extent, I mean, I actually think the literature, by and large, including the, like, like App's work, for example, is way too much focused on courts. So App says, a right revolution happens when courts start issuing rights protecting decisions, but then again, it doesn't, doesn't mean that, an act that this translates into improved outcomes that you can measure in human rights indicators. So I guess that's one answer, but the other answer is I think you're right, and this is something we're still wrestling with. Like you could say, well, whether or not a trade union gets to form in the first place may depend on on system, right? So there, you can imagine a country where they have a, a right to unionize in the constitution, and what we argue, or at least we try to, we, we're still exploring this. Like the cons the constitution may help these unions to form because it's sort of potentially ensures their, their, their future stability and so on. But if you are, if you are North Korea, the right to unionize is never going to mean anything because you don't have like a window in which you can have the union to form, right? So I think one condition for the theory to work is you need to have a sort of a window of opportunity for these organizations to emerge, which I think is often true. And so many times the stories of constitution writing, especially when n new and protective rights are written into the constitution, is one where there is this moment of sort of opening up democratization that later becomes like, and then you see later backsliding, but there is this moment where there is, there is this window where there is a genuine prospect for democracy in many cases. But this is still, I think this is a weakness of our theory and so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the idea, right? So that you actually see these organizations, and we're we're currently in the process of performing some case studies. So just uh, was in Zambia talking to union leaders, right? And and I mean, in Zambia is interesting because they had an imposed constitution, so there was nothing. Uh, endogenous to the constitution itself and then the unions were very instrumental in moving to a two-party democracy right it became the effective political opposition that came out of the unions and they they called nationwide strikes many right so that's uh and m that was their mechanism and not the courts right but so so i guess that's yeah that's uh, uh okay I'll, I'll i'll do a few more questions and then I'll, I'll make sure i'll get to my um, to s showing you some of the the results although uh yeah there well, it seems to me that constitutions are usually written by uh, ruling classes, mm -hmm. and that uh, some of it, uh, some of the rights that are written into the constitution are just words, but they uh, also might be the ideals of certain individuals who would like to see certain mm -hmm. rights available. But that uh, you seem to regard the constitution as constraining the government. But uh, it seems to me also that constraints are necessary on individuals and on groups because many of the threats to human rights in any society mm -hmm. are likely to be uh, one minority group uh, uh, directing certain kinds of, of uh, authority on other minority groups. And, uh, and this is something that the government uh, often is involved in not as one that's violating rights, but as one that's defending rights. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, there's a lot there in your question, but 
you put your finger on what I think is one of the great paradoxes of both international human rights law and constitutional rights law, or, or constitutional rights, is we both want to constrain the government because the government is bad, right? The government may abuse power. And then we also want, need the government to deal with private human rights violations, like let's say in the realm of women's rights, like CEDAW is very aggressive, right? Like wants the government to police private relationship between men and women in the family home, right? So you both, the state is both <laughs> uh, the thing we want to constrain, but then we also want to enable it to, to respect uh, to, to protect individual rights. And I think this is one of the eternal dilemmas of international human rights law and for international human rights advocates, right? If you have a document like the Women's Rights Convention, it gives enormous amount of power to a government to eradicate, change the curriculum, eradicate cultural practices, police how men and how husband and wife interact with one another. Whereas at the same time, the government is not exactly great either in many of the countries where this is needed the most. So this is, I mean, and so this is also a, a dilemma for constitutions, right? So the United States <laughs> Constitution has solved the, there's this funny thing called the state action doctrine, which suggests if the state hasn't acted, then this is, uh, we're outside of the realm of constitutional law. So in other words, the US Constitution does by and large not constrain it, concern itself with private discrimination, but the US is exceptional in this respect. So almost every other country, there is a, like, there's no equivalent to the state action doctrine, meaning uh, cons co constitutions do impose the obligation to, to police private behavior. Uh, so I, th yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a point that's well taken. Uh, you also say that like, constitutions, of course, can be aspirational, and of course they can, right? I mean, they often are when they are written. I mean, I actually think one thing that's interesting, so you, you said it's, they tend to be elite products. That is historically true. Ever since the 1990s, uh, we were sort of in this new mode of constitution making whereby participation is considered to be one of the most important uh, things for, so we've, there used to be this field of, scholarship called constitutional design and the sense that we know what a good constitution looks like, right? And then Yale law professors would go to Eastern Europe and say, oh, you need to have this and this and this. And then like t uh, 10 years later, we're still, we're, uh, there it turns out, right, that these documents don't, uh, they often fail. So I think where the, the, the sort of rule of law community, U.S. Institute of Peace, Max Planck, international idea, these organizations that are doing constitution making, where they are now is like, we don't really know what a good constitution looks like, but we know what a good process looks like. So, th so from, from the traditional model of the imposed constitution or the Japanese constitution that was written by General MacArthur in secret in, in seven days, right, we're now in a point in time where you have the South African model, that uh, our constitution, that's a model which is have a lot of popular participation, uh, go to the villages, workshop the constitution, get submissions from all sorts of people. So there is this move to popular participation, which is actually, I mean, it's one, it's not something that features in our work, although be worth thinking about, like, does it affect in any way, like, these outcomes. Uh, I'll do one more question, and then maybe I'll go back to my presentation for. I'll give my time back to you. I'd just like to continue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So then. Okay. So. Um, so how? So that's sort of the the main theoretical insight. So how do we go about testing this? Uh, so first of all, our book manuscript. We hope to do, uh, or we are in the process of doing. Uh, uh, basically using a lot of different methods that we have been able to think of because, I mean, it's hard to get this right, right? To get the, at the causal effect of putting a constitutional rights provision in the Constitution and how that uh, affects outcomes. Uh, nothing is random. Uh, endogeneity problems are huge. I think, I mean, I always encounter people who say, you simply can't do this, give up the project. I uh, disagree. I, my take is even though our methods are imperfect, I'd like to get it in as many ways as I possibly can. Uh, but we're never going to have anything close to an experimental setting for constitutions, right? I can't randomly assign rights to countries to evaluate their impact. It's just not going to happen. Uh, so in the, in the book where, uh, so we, we have the quantitative analysis and that we've been publishing and we're, I'm going to present that in a second. Uh, but we're also uh, planning to do case studies. Actually, this slide is a little old. We were going to, we started, Adam and I started out with this 
this is, uh, he likes this idea a lot. I'm, I'm a comparativist and I'm a little bit more skeptical, but he, it's like, let's just do randomly generated, like, let's do a matching algorithm to select our cases and it could be anywhere in the world and we just go where the computer sends us and then, you know, we'll just do our case studies there. Uh, which then sent, brought up all these pairs where somebody with knowledge was like, well, I'm not sure if those are very interesting. So, uh, so we've been struggling with this a little bit. Uh, our current plan is to go to the countries where we see rights under pressure right now to see how this is playing out at the moment. So we're planning on doing Hungary, Poland, and Turkey as cases that are, were relatively well-functioning democracies and we've seen recent pushback and, and repression of rights because then you can see at the moment whether people are protesting and so on. Uh, whereas, I mean, I went to Zambia because it was one of our randomly selected pairs and then people, you're interviewing people and they're referring to this 40-year period in which stuff has happened. So it's not as useful, I found, to tease out the mechanisms. But that's something we're still uh, working on. Uh, then we're doing survey experiments. So we got, it's pretty cool, we got permission from the ILO and the International Confederation of Trade Unions to do a survey experiment among leader, union leaders all over the world to use their, uh, to use their network. So we get to do for all, every country where unions have a presence to get there, which is pretty much everywhere, uh, to get to do a survey, and, and which I'm probably a survey experiment and not a survey, which we hope to get at, like, do they actually use the Constitution in their advocacy as opposed to they're doing this anyway and the Constitution is not useful for them. And then we're finally exploring this natural experiment, which is the following, uh, that um, uh, the, during British decolonization, halfway through the process, the British decided they needed to put a Bill of Rights in the constitutions of their former colonies, uh, which happened after Nigeria. So like Ghana did not get a Bill of Rights. So the British, as part of the requirements for becoming independent, they wrote this constitution for all of these countries. And then after Nigeria, they started getting worried about human rights. They hadn't initially thought about it because the British don't have a constitution or a Bill of Rights themselves, so they didn't care about it. And then they start putting those in and they're boilerplate. They're all the exact same Bill of Rights word for word. So we want to sort of compare those countries that got the Bill of Rights to those who didn't. So that's uh, something else we're uh, looking at. So, so the, I mean, this book is going to take us forever to write, probably, because we have all these ideas. And, uh, and it's a hard question, right? So, but we're, so we're thinking about all these different methods. Um, so, but at this point, we have only done the quantitative analysis. So I'm going to present you some of the uh, present some of the main insights from that. Uh, sorry, let me just, yeah, um, sorry, I'm just, I lost my, um, okay, so this is our, so this is our main identification strategy. So what we do, uh, so we use this three-step uh, process uh, which we basically borrowed from Jonathan Lupu, uh, who has proposed this in a series of paper where he looked at the impact of human rights treaty effectiveness. In general, we feel like it's this, like the almost non-existing literature on constitutional rights effectiveness can borrow from the literature on human rights treaty ratification because those guys are like 60 papers in and they've made a lot of methodological advances over, over the years, so we, we borrow from them. So what uh, Lupu does, and what we uh, what we uh, what we follow is this three-step method. So first, ideal, using ideal point estimation, then matching, and then post-matching regression. I'll come back to that. Oh, let me first say something about uh, the data. So the data on constitutional rights. So I basically collected the whole constitutional rights data set. This was my dissertation project. It's kind of a sad story. I spent a year in the Oxford Bodleian Law Library. Uh, reading constitutional documents, and by the end of it, I had all countries. Uh, so it covers 186 countries. It's available from 1946 to 2012. Although more or less at the same time as I was doing my project, uh, the Comparative Constitution Project, y which you may have heard of, has done a similar coding exercise. So these were two independently uh, performed projects. Actually, the Comparative Constitution Project is like Tom Ginsburg, Zach Alkins, they, uh, they run that. Uh, they had 75 research assistants, so I still remember finding out about their project and not sleeping for two weeks. I'm like, 
do I need to start my dissertation over again? And then I just decided to keep going. And it worked out fine if anybody will find themselves in that position. Just keep going. And <laughs> there's always room for more papers. And, 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 and w at some point, we ended up cross-checking the data against each other, which was actually useful. Like our turned out we like there was some systematic problems with my data which is sometimes I had missed the constitution but they had more like were more much more likely to have coding errors because they relied on research assistance but the overall intercoder reliability was higher than 99% so it was pretty good uh, we were pretty happy with that so then our de facto constitu uh, de facto our outcome measures uh, mainly come from the the same Cornelli Richard human rights data set, which uh, people have used uh, very often. It's basically political scientists coding US State Department and Amnesty International country reports. So we use those uh, for, for where available. We use it for the freedom of association, freedom of religion, uh, political parties, uh, a, a number of others. Uh, but those are not the only uh, data we use. So we also have some. Um, some data, like for our social and economic rights data, we use government spending on healthcare and education and housing and social security as a percentage of GDP per capita. So that's our dependent variable for the social and economic rights because we think one of the most direct way to measure whether social and economic rights provisions affect government behavior is to see whether they actually spend more money on providing education. So that's our dependent variable there. For the prohibition of torture, we use Ferris's data as our primary instrument. Uh, and then we've started to this, ex there's this new data set that some people may have heard of uh, varieties of democracy that also creates human rights indicators. But interestingly, not based on one standardized report that they code, but relying on local experts. Uh, and some of our results, I, I, so actually Kevin Cope and Charles Crabtree are doing a set of papers sort of comparing these measures and how they're systematically different from each other. I think your overarching finding is they're pretty different, right? Although. So we found for association and political parties that our results are the same using this, these measures, but not for religion, actually. So uh, in any case, so that's, that's the data. Uh, so, so let me just talk about the three steps. Uh, so this is, uh, let me talk about the three steps. So with the data, what do we do? So first step is we perform ideal point estimation to get a sense of the preferences that a country has uh, for, for the level of constitutional rights protection. Uh, and we just do this using W nominate to basically systematically explain variations in constitutional rights. So this is a technique that is commonly used by political scientists uh, to look at the voting behavior at legislatures and then to scale legislatures and see what explains their voting behavior. Uh, People have also done it for the US Supreme Court. I have a separate paper that deals with sort of what these dimensions are in substance. Uh, but what we do here following Lupo is based on these ideal points, we get a sense of the overall preferences that a country has for certain rights, but then we calculate the probability that it will give, adopt any given rights based on its general pattern of rights adoption. So we so know that if you adopt education, healthcare, and a bunch of other rights, you're pretty likely to also have a right to housing in your constitution. Whereas if you, let's say, adopt a prohibition of torture and fair trial rights, you may be less likely to have the right to housing in your constitution, right? So we, we have these probabilities so that we think a country will adopt the right that we're interested in based on their other uh, their overall level of uh, rights protection. Uh, and then second, the second step is we do propensity score matching, which is that for every country of interest, we find a country that is as close as possible to that country but does not have the right. Oh, sorry, so for every country that has a right, we find a, a match that is as close as possible but does not have the right in question. Uh, and one of the things we match on are these probabilities generated in the first state through our ideal point estimation, which means that we're effectively comparing countries that have almost the same bill of rights, except one happens to have the right and the other doesn't, right? That's the, that's the idea. Uh, and then in addition to that, we, we match on the, the usual variables, GDP, civil war, judicial independence. We also lag on uh, the uh, uh, we also, sorry, match on the lag dependent variable, meaning that we compare countries that have pretty similar rights records prior to their adoption of the constitutional rights. So that's another thing we match on. Uh, 
So, so as a result of the matching, we basically get a more limited sample uh, whereby for each country we have a matched country that the, each country with the right we have a matched country that doesn't have the right. And then finally we run regression analysis on our more limited data sample uh, to, to just get at the uh, because there's some remaining imbalance. So these, these, the, the countries that we matched on each other aren't perfectly similar so we still do uh, regression analysis. So that's Sort of, and it is basically following Lupu for the most part, although in the various review processes we made a few changes, but that's the idea. Uh, so then on the slides, I have the results. So basically, in a nutshell, I'll just tell you first, uh, we find a statistically significant and fairly robust, because we do a lot of robustness checks, uh, effect for the right to form political parties, the right to unionize. Uh, the freedom of association, the freedom of religion, and, the, and gender equality provisions. And we find an effect for those basically in our full sample of countries without having to condition it on democracy or judicial independence or, or anything like that. Uh, by contrast, we find no, so here in, in these graphs, I should say, so the, uh, the, the dots are basically the, uh, the marginal effects from an ordered logit regression and uh, the lines are the confidence interval. So if they cross zero, the, the effect is not statistically significant. So we, have, uh, so we do not find an effect for the freedom of expression, the freedom of movement, the prohibition of torture, and any of the social economic rights, actually. Uh, so, so this is, and, 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 and not only do we not find an effect for many of these, uh, it's not only not statistically significant, but also substantively very small, especially for the social economic rights. Like the um, impact of the right to housing on spending on housing is pretty much zero, right? It's neither statistically significant or we don't find any extra uh, uh, or, or, or large in any way. Uh, so that's... I mean, I can show you more. So here, you ha like to give you some ex a sense of the magnitude. So for the right to unionize, for example, I think these are pretty substantial effects that we find actually. So we find uh, the 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 probability of a fully unrestricted right of no having no restrictions on the right to unionize increases from 22 percent to 35 percent, whereas the probability of having a severely or, or being having severely restricted rights upon the adoption of the right to unionize goes from 47% to 31%. So I think those are pretty substantial effects. It's, it's hard to get very intuitive for the, the sort of ordinal variables that we have. But that's, uh, so that gives you some uh, sense of, of that. Uh, I think I'm just going to open it up for, for questions, right? Because I'm supposed to, uh, I can say more. Like we did a bunch of robustness checks. So we, like one of the things I find reassuring is when we, like estimate the model different ways is that uh, if we just or run an ordinary panel regression with fixed effects included, then the results hold up, which is I think pretty good because I s it's my sense a lot of the human rights treaty literature is not robust to the inclusion of country fixed effects, whereby we basically control for all things that are constant uh, within a country. So I think, I mean, I won't go into this. It will get really boring if I go talk to you about all our robustness checks. So let me just pull up the the basic results. Uh, so yeah, I guess I'll just open it up to, to questions. Uh, yeah. How do you handle uh, associational arrangements where you have essentially a sub-state that's uh, uh, pursuing or not pursuing a bunch of rights and probably has more of a, let's say, a firm grip on its population than, than do the larger states that are of which it's a part? Ah, OK. So you're talking about state constitutions, basically. Right? So, so some countries that are especially federal systems, they have constitutions also at the state level, right? Like, like in the US. Uh, I don't know if anybody has read Michigan's constitution. I've written on state constitutions. They're uh, fascinating, in this, especially for the following reason that everybody always says, oh, Americans, they don't like social rights. This is a deeply libertarian tradition. Well, go take a look at state constitutions. You'll find a right to health care. Uh, unionize and so on in many of these documents. Uh, so yes, they exist. I mean, most countries that are federal do not have as much of a tradition of like well-developed state constitutions that vary from one state to another, right? So uh, so often they're much more similar to one another. It's just like sort of a boilerplate constitution. Uh, 
Uh, but in any case, they're not part of my analysis, right? So this is looking at how constitutional rights at the federal level ex uh, change government behavior at the federal level. So it doesn't take into account the state constitutions, which would only affect a small number of states. I mean, there's bigger problems with this data, right? Like lawyers are always keen to point. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure if it's a problem, but it's an omission, right? Like, for example, when we code whether a right is in the Constitution, we do not have the judicial interpretations of those rights, so courts can interpret a constitutional right and restrict it or expand it. Uh, they may find a right where there is not no clear basis for it in the text. Uh, I mean, my response to that is that this is mainly a problem for a country like the U.S., where the Constitution is 200 w uh, years old and 7,000 words long, uh, where there a lot of what the meaning of the Bill of Rights is is made up in judicial interpretations, whereas many other countries that have newer Constitution and mar mainly much longer, more detailed constitutions, this is less of an omission. But it's a, I mean, it's a limitation, right? And we acknowledge that. And the same for state constitutions. I mean, a British constitutional lawyer will raise their hand and say, well, you don't take into account constitutional conventions, which is certain practices that have taken the, the, the character of constitutional law. So it's only based on what's written at the federal level, is the answer. Uh, any other? Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so here, so, so here, like as I said for, so here you have for the, the right to political parties, uh, you have a, you see a 10, like you see the, the probability of there are no restrictions on the right increase by something like eight percentage points, if I see that correctly, or no, I don't have the numbers on my, on my, on my notes. Uh, whereas the probability of that of it being severely restricted increases by six percentage points or so, and you can compare that against something like a baseline probability of adopting those rights, which is what I did in that marginal effect uh, graphs. This is the right to form political parties that I'm mentioning, right? So you see, I mean, it's hard to get your really get a really good sense of what these numbers really mean. Uh, because the data is sort of weird ordinal data, but it gives you some sense that there is. So once you adopt the right, so the, uh, I mean, maybe it's just take a step back. Uh, so the, the data that we use uh, fits into three categories. So the, the, this data by Singanelli Richard, it will say either, like let's say for uh, the right to unionize, it will say either there's no restrictions on trade unions, there is some restrictions on trade unions or there is severe restrictions on trade unions. It's not very granular, the, the human rights data in that respect, but it, it places countries in these three categories. So what we do here is we say, relative to the middle category, we see countries move. Uh, once you adopt a right, you, they're more likely to move into the unrestricted category and, and, and move out of the severely restricted category. That's the, the interpretation of those results. Uh, I can. The freedom, effect of freedom of religion is actually one of the larger ones, uh, which is interesting. So you'll see that the, the once you adopt the pro, uh, prohibition of, uh, sorry, uh, freedom of religion protection in your constitution, you actually see uh, the, the probability of being, of having severe restrictions on the freedom of religion decrease by close to 26 percentage points. And uh, the probability of having uh, fully unrestricted freedom exercise of religion increased by close to 20 percentage points. So it's one, although we, I must say for f both freedom of religion and freedom of association where we also find a pretty large effect as you can see, uh, they are uh, not as statistically significant in all of our robustness checks. So they're less robust, although they're pretty good, but we, so for the, uh, right to unionize and the right to form political parties. It's basically no matter what we do, we'll keep finding an effect. You can throw any model at it and it will work. Uh, but for these other ones, it's a little, uh, they're a slightly, I, I can destroy those results if I want to, uh, especially when I start adding country fixed effects and, 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 and other things. But, but they're pretty, I mean, they're, they're pretty, like it w and we say that in our, our AJPS paper, like there's some specifications where they lose significance. Uh, so yeah, so where, I mean, where does that leave us, right? So, so we have these 
sort of statistical results that suggest, well, there is this correlation for some of those rights, right? Or maybe even a causal effect. Like if you put them in your constitution, you find that these rights actually improve in practice. And, and uh, whereas for other rights, such as the freedom of torture, prohibition of torture, uh, we find no effect at all, no matter what we do. Uh, and the same for social rights, which is maybe disappointing, considering there's a lot of activism around social rights. Uh, around the world at the moment a, and, and a lot of attention for countries like Colombia and the Constitutional Court. I don't know if people follow, if anybody's interested in, in social rights particularly, but there is uh, a lot of interesting case law coming out of the South African Constitutional Court enforcing social rights decision uh, in Colombia, but we don't find that these increase uh, spending. However, of course, like these kind of cross-national regression analysis are always they're always limited in many ways in the sense that like the mechanism that we claim to be at work, of course we cannot actually in, uh, uh, find that from our cross-country regression analysis, right? I, I mean, the fact that we find an effect for certain rights doesn't provide evidence for our claim that organizations push for their own interests systematically and protest and so on. So to get actually at sort of the, the micro mechanisms behind this, we have to do case studies. We have to go to countries, talk to people, do survey experiments. I mean, talk to union leaders and see whether they actually, actually use the Constitution in their work. Uh, so that's, I think that's important, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, are some rights more vague than others? Uh -huh. So, you haven't shown how it would be very context or country specific how a particular right is yeah. actually used, right? So, the right, you know, because I was looking at, you know, I don't know, like North Korea or Pakistan. It's like, well, how do they define citizen, right? Or yeah. how do they define, but the data, right, are all the same. You're using the same measures across. Yeah. I mean, I think. Yeah. No, I think. I mean, there's uh, two levels at which I can answer the question, right? So one is, even within this group of rights we look at, some are more specific than others, and you could say the ones on the left, the right to form political parties, is a pretty specific right, whereas free right to right to health, right? As often, like many constitutions don't even say a right to access to health care, but they just say a right to health. Uh, what does that mean, right? It's, it's so, so I mean, as, and so I do think a competing explanation, which we have to look into or think about is, is just, I mean, if you believe that rights are focal points around which you can organize and your right is being violated, you get to wave the Constitution at your government for it being violated, you, you need a certain degree of specificity, right? To the extent it's not, if the, the norm itself is very vague, then it's hard to wave the government at the Constitution at the government to say it's violated because it's not clear what the norm is. So I, and I actually think this is something, I know you, you've been doing some work on, on specificity. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think this is worth looking into more, I mean, both in the human rights treaty literature and, and the constitutional rights literature, because specificity presumably matters for the enforcement of rights, because they can then be it become. Also just matters then what data you use, too. You know, and yeah, so, and I guess the other. We all use various kind of procedures yeah. that are out there, which are presuming the same uh -huh. It would be fairly easy for me to collect information on how many words are spent on the freedom of association, for example, or how many, how specific the right is drafted. Uh, I mean, and I, I, I generally have, like I have a paper where I look at specificity of constitutions overall, right? So I, I mean, it's, it's something I, I, that's worth exploring. Uh, so maybe that's what helps people organize. I don't think that explanation will ultimately get us as far as I think the explanation we're exploring here. But in general, I think it's a, a very important observation uh, that specificity matters, right? And I think it's a good thing. I mean, there's also the debate on whether we need more human rights treaties and specific treaties, even though all the rights that we're interested in are already enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and 
the sort of international Bill of Rights, ICCPR, ICESER. And I mean, if you believe specificity matters, then the answer is yes, right? Uh, so I think it's an, it's an important uh, point. Yeah. Uh, with the collapse of colonialism in the 20th century, a lot of constitutions got written because a lot of things were defined as nations that had been colonies before. Mm -hmm. It's true. But, um, also, there were social movements. There were um, there was civic involvement of people in governance uh, who hadn't been involved in it before. And it occurs to me that, uh, well, I would raise the question, was the assertion of human rights in constitutions a cause or an effect of mm -hmm. these social movements? Mm -hmm. So I guess the answer is it depends, right? So we know the British colonizers, when they decolonized, they wrote the constitutions for their the countries. Uh, so actually, so there was this moment when the decolonization, there was a big movement of constitution writing. Uh, the British constitutions, they're all collectively referred to as Lancaster House constitutions, and they were written in London. And it was like as part of the negotiations for independence, these countries got these constitutions. The French, on the other hand, they were just like, bye-bye, and they didn't do any of that stuff, right? They just, I mean, they took the last light bulb with them and they just left. Uh, and, and so, and they, so for the French former colonies, you see, uh, you, you see, you see, actually it's very interesting. So you see there a lot of emulation of the French constitution, even though the French had nothing to do with it, which I always find a little fascinating, right? So they have the same provisions, like, like the French constitution has this weird provision which says the president shall guarantee the independence of the judiciary. And I'm always like, uh, because I tried to code once to code whether or not independence, judicial independence was constitutionally protected. And I'm like, what am I supposed to make of this, right? <laughs> uh -huh. But it guess it make more sense in the universe of a civil law system, perhaps. But in any case, so you see a lot of emulation of the former colonies constitution. Uh, you see Philippines ending up with a constitution that's very similar to the US. And uh, so I'm not sure how much social movements were sort of writing constitutions in a way that, ref that to reflect the social movement. I mean, I do think, so one point that is a problem for our theory, or maybe not, but in any case, something we're, we have to deal with uh, is that, so we're saying the right to unionize strengthens unions, and unions can protect their own interests. So if the government uh, encroaches upon the right to unionize, unions will strike and do all these things to protect their interests. So there is a question, did the right to unionize get to become constitutionalized because there were strong unions, right? So that is, uh, which is basically a, a big endogeneity problem potentially. And I, uh, and I mean, and this is something we, we, so we know there's cases where that's true, right? Tunisia just wrote a new constitution uh, and it was like the unions were tremendously important in sort of the transition to democracy and they got really strong union protections as a result. But we also know there's cases where constitutions were simply imposed. Like the, the notion of an imposed constitution is not limited to the British former colonies. I mean, Japan, you can come with a fairly long list of countries where constitutions were basically externally driven. So one thing we're doing is do a limited sample of only imposed constitutions and, uh, and see whether our because they're exogenous constitutions, arguably, so that's, uh, but it's something we're wrestling with. I mean, the other answer is maybe it's okay to say, oh, unions were already strong, they got their interests constitutionally protected, and then they become even stronger compared to countries where there is unions, but they don't get to put it in their constitution. But this is something we kind of just sort of have to sort out, uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, there are so constant. There is some er very interesting early work uh, coming out of sort of the uh, 
the World Polity School at Stanford, a sociologist that have looked at constitution and described them as an example of sort of the world polity dictating cultural norms that are sort of adopted everywhere, meaning constitutions are fairly standardized, right? And they are standardized. You find protect, I mean, North Korea has a beautiful Bill of Rights, right? So I do think uh, there is a sense, although it, it's not universally true, but there is a sense that these, even these repressive regimes that you don't expect to have nice constitutions still have nice constitutions. Uh, and part of it is maybe at the time of constitution writing, there was a genuine hope that they'd be a democracy and there was backsliding and that doesn't get reflected in the constitution necessarily. Uh, and the other part of it is there it just may just be simply sham, right? Why did North Korea write the constitution like that? Why? It's a good question. I don't know. I guess it's advertising to the world or something like that. But I think to the extent there is either movement in the direction of theocracy or, or sort of just strongly religious-based legal systems or, uh, or autocracy, it may not necessarily be reflected in the Constitution. Although the theocracy point, actually, maybe I should take that back because a lot of these countries do have provisions in their Constitution that make Islam a source of law and, uh, and, and, and give it higher status. Uh, although it's interesting, like a place like Egypt, like when they rewrote their constitution after the Arab Spring, everybody was going crazy. We're like, oh, they're elevating the sta status of Islam. It's not true. That provision had always been there. Uh, it was just uh, not a, a, a very Islamist state because there was a repressive, like the repressive re Mubarak regime. So I, I don't know. So I do think these changes don't. Al sometimes they get reflected in the constitution as the constitution gets reflected, uh, rewritten wholesale, and sometimes it doesn't, right? Uh, but then as another caveat, there is also the type of constitutions that are just brutally honest. Saudi Arabia never tried to write a fake bill of rights. They just don't have one. <laughs> so there are, there are some exceptions. Like yeah. <laughs> well, and there, I mean, there's this interesting debate to be had. Do you, as human rights activists, do we prefer these countries to have sham constitutions that are then maybe still can be used as tools for advocacy to push them to do certain things, or do you rather have them be brutally honest, and then we can say, well, you know, you're <laughs> you're just violating uh, the norms. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, if we looked at all your individual cases, would it be useful to look at instances in which the Constitution did not change, but the practice did? Uh -huh. uh, um, are there certain rights that are subject? to revision and, and practice and others that are not. Mm -hmm. And could one identify the organizing pressures then that mm -hmm. are feasible in s for certain rights and maybe don't apply to others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it partly goes just to the broader question, when do constitu when do rights change, right? How, do you, when, how and when do you see improvements in rights protection? Because uh, the way you phrase the question, you're almost not interested in the constitutional part anymore. Well, no, because it, it, the Constitution could be seen as setting up uh, a context or a problem uh -huh. to be interpreted. Uh -huh. And over time, uh, some interpretations don't oh, change yeah, yeah. and don't come into play. Uh -huh. And others, tensions build uh -huh. that lead to uh, sharp change in practice, but maybe not in the Constitution. Yeah, interesting. I mean, and it partly goes to the question, like, so if you have a country like the U.S. where it gets interpreted, like the Constitution stays stable, but judicial interpretations change all, all the time. I mean, it's we're doing a study of like those kind of like how these, th I mean, if you want, so you could say what I code here or present here is the large C Constitution, right, with a capital C, and like the larger body of constitutional law. I wouldn't call it practice because then you're in the realm of actual rights practices. It's the small C Constitution, which comprises of judicial interpretation, in implementing legislation. And I think, I mean, it, there's no doubt we're missing that step. Right, like the judicial interpretations and how they change. Uh, well, I was it's not the easy to. Can one identify the kinds of pressures that cause a constitution to alter its meaning without altering its practice? Yeah. Like and the Second I Amendment interpretation? Yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, and it happens, right? It's, it, I mean, countries do, or gay marriage is now legal, right? And it wasn't before. One <laughs> overnight, the Constitution didn't change, right? So you have, uh, I mean, some people, like, there's a whole literature on this. Some people have called them partial constitutional amendments. I was or more of African colonies where there's been ex colonies. <laughs> Well, there, there is less uh, great news coming from constitutional courts than I think, by and large, we've seen here. Well, I'm but not sure the change has to come from courts. Uh -huh. uh, and that's, that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, then, but then you get into the realm of actual practices, which may in part be caused by constitutional rights or people mobilizing to protect them, right? But it's, I mean, those are, it's, uh, yeah, it's hard to disentangle all these different effects. Uh, this is like an attempt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, we don't have to leave this room, but if you before we just check in with a little question for the chat question, please go on back to the Yeah, I, I, I can hang out here for like five minutes, five minutes and then unfortunately yeah. I have to go catch my flight pretty much right away. But if I don't, I'm more than happy to, to answer questions by email as well, of course. Thank you so much. <laughs>